welcome to welcome to the Australian Intercultural Societies webinar series. There is no place like home. A discussion on homelessness. My name is Serap Azizolo, and I am an AIS member. For those of you joining us for the first time, AIS is a non-for-profit organisation established in a pre-9/11 world with a view of strengthening mutual respect and understanding between people of diverse communities through meaningful engagement. Today's program is an example of this endeavor as AIS has partnered with the Salvation Army and the City of Melbourne to bring you this event. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we, get, we gather and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Before we move on to our program, I'd like to inform you of some of our upcoming webinars. On Wednesday, 12th of August, we'll host a youth panel webinar titled, Shut Up and Listen, Multicultural Youth Voices 2020. In this partnership with Victoria University, Ethnic Communities Council of Victoria, Centre for Multicultural Youth, the Victorian Multicultural Commission. Followed by our next webinar, Thursday, 10th of September, the Youth Suicide Prevention Panel in partnership with the Australian Institute of Family Studies. In addition, on Thursday, the 15th of September, we will be partnering the Equal Opportunity Network Summit 2020. All of these programs details can be found on the AIS website. We encourage you to engage with the conversations as our, as, by asking questions on the chat section on the YouTube screen. Moving on to tonight's program, the panel aims to provide insightful information on an issue that has been around for a very long time, homelessness. Homelessness is a social issue and needs to be addressed by both government and civil society through proper planning, investment, and a healthy dose of compassion. We may be able to help those who are sleeping through rough through their lives and put their lives back on track. This program allows for voices to be expressed, but also through society, we will be able to hear real stories and hear their lives. To get the program underway, I would like to introduce our moderator, Ali Moore. Our moderator has more than 25 years experience as a journalist and a broadcaster. Working for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, Australia's Nine Network and the BBC's Global Network, based in Singapore. She has covered major news and current affairs across the region, reporting from Australia, Singapore, Malaysia, and China. Her previous roles include ABC China correspondent, host for Australia's premier late night TV current affairs program, including Late Line, and anchor of some of the country's key business news programs, such as Business Sunday and Late Line Business. In Singapore, Ellie worked for the BBC's major regional television news programs, reporting on key events such as, inter such as an, for an international audience. She is a former Vice Chancellor's Fellow at the University of Melbourne, a position held for two years during which she produced and presented the This Is Not A Drill series for hypothet of Hypothetical with Asia Link, the ABC and the Wheeler Centre. Ellie is now a freelance broadcaster and journalist regularly appearing as a host on ABC Radio Melbourne. Thank you, Ellie, for moderating tonight's discussion and I'll now hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that uh, very generous uh, welcome. <laughs> it's always awkward hearing one's bio read, but I'm just going to put in a little plug for that. This is not a drill series because in fact, I did a hypothetical 18 months ago on exactly the situation we're in now. It was a pandemic. Uh, it started to the north of us and it spread across the world. So there you go. Welcome everyone. I would like to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet wherever we may be and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. This is such an extraordinary time and I hope very much that you're all well and that you've got what you need to get through the next six weeks if you live in Victoria. You know, 
I've spoken with the Salvos a number of times in the past, and I don't think any of us ever imagined that we'd be talking about a time when thousands of people are sleeping. Well, they were sleeping rough and they've actually got a roof over their head. And if this pandemic has done anything, I think it's highlighted the issues faced by those who were already struggling in the community. But it's also, of course, very clear to us that four walls and a roof are vital, but they're only one part of the story. And there are so many other needs which have to be met and finding permanent solutions is incredibly complex. So to go through some of this, I'd like to introduce our lovely panel this afternoon. Deputy Lord Mayor of the City of Melbourne, Aaron Wood. In addition to being the Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Wood is also the founder of the Teaching Kids Program, which is an award-winning environmental education program. Uh, Aaron is also, I don't know if you know this, but a reality TV star. Last year, he was part of the SBS docu-series, uh, docu-series Filthy Rich and Homeless. Um, of course, he likes to say he's not filthy rich and he's not homeless, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he did give it a fair, a fair go. I'm very much welcome, Aaron. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Ali. Lo lovely to be here. I, yes, I'm waiting for that Tats Lotto ticket to come off before I can claim the filthy rich part, but lovely to be here this evening. Aren't we all? Uh, Major Brendan Nottle, who I feel quite sure is familiar to all of you. Brendan leads the Salvos uh, Melbourne Project 614, which seeks out those living on our, the fringe of society and helps them ease their way back in. He's a Salvos veteran, and as everyone knows, he's an absolute legend. Welcome, Brendan, to you. Great. Thanks, to be, uh, thanks for having me here, Ali. Great to be part of it. Also joining us this afternoon, Shalali. Uh, Shalali is a first year social work student and she's also someone who's benefited greatly from the work Brendan and his team do and she'll share a little of her experience with us this afternoon. Shalali, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> And uh, last but absolutely not least, Trevor. You may well uh, have met Trevor before. He works with Project 614 and he's got some really exciting news on the housing front, which I'm going to let him share. Trevor, welcome. Tell us your news. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I, uh, after years of trying to get a flat, I finally got one and I move in next Wednesday. That is such wonderful news, Trevor, and I'm going to ask you a little bit more about it uh, I know that we can't all be there to help you, but we'll be there in spirit, but, you know, absolutely. Just to, to uh, say to everyone who's listening and a reminder that you can ask questions, I'll take questions a little bit later in the conversation, but if you can use the chat section of YouTube, that's the best way to ask a question and they'll come through to me. Brendan, if I can start with you, I'm guessing that you never thought you'd see a day where so many Victorians in need were in hotels. And I suppose that's a great thing, but it's not the end of it, is it? No, absolutely not. And I think uh, I, I, I can't recall a time where I've been so terrified. And uh, when word started to spread about COVID-19 hitting our shores, uh, I was convinced that we would see hundreds of really vulnerable people, if not more, uh, actually die. And um, uh, surprisingly, that's not the case. And thank goodness it's not. But to see the state government's response has been really positive. So they've opened up opportunities for people to get off the street, go into hotel accommodation. But as you say, we've got to be um, really planning and thinking and understanding that that's not a solution. At least it's keeping people safe and it's making sure that um, hopefully they're not impacted by COVID-19, but we need to be thinking about next steps. And it's not just a roof over their head, it's actually about a roof over the head plus appropriate supports. That's the critical piece as well. Yeah, absolutely, because when you talk about appropriate support, there is this core group of people who are still on the streets, isn't there? That's right. We've got teams out seven nights a week and they're working with a group of between 30 to 35 people that have all been offered hotel accommodation uh, by a range of services, but they've either been in and come out or they've refused to take, uh, take up that option. And it's very easy to judge those people and say, well, gosh, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, why aren't you taking up this free accommodation? And for them, when you sit down and have the conversation, you find out very quickly that homelessness is not their primary issue, but serious and complex mental health issues are, and sometimes addictions as well. So they need a different response, and we're working on that at the moment. The City of Melbourne have actually been excellent in their response, as has Victoria Police, and we partner with both of those agencies very, very closely, and we're doing all we can to not just get people off the streets, but actually get them the support that they need so that they're starting to address those really complex issues that... If we're not addressing those, they'll remain on the street and in the middle of a pandemic, who knows where that may end up. 
I want to return to some of those issues in a minute, Brendan, but as well as uh, people we would maybe traditionally think of as being homeless in places like Melbourne, I understand that you served about 130 people in just 90 minutes uh, through the cafe window on Tuesday. And some of those people were people you've never seen before. That's absolutely right. So I think one of the good things about our community is their, uh, their hearts and minds are actually turning to the homeless and saying, gosh, we're in the middle of a pandemic, we need to look after that group. But we need to make sure that we don't forget those people that are very much at risk of homelessness. And I'm talking about international students who actually can't leave our country and go home. Uh, they were depending on the hospitality industry and that's pretty well shut down now. So their sources of income pretty much have dried up. And so we serve our meals rather than from our cafe that was designed uh, to care for people at homeless or risk of homelessness. We're now doing that uh, during COVID through a window. And we're seeing, as you mentioned, a significant number of international students every night coming for meals. We're also seeing um, workers who are, are casual workers whose work has dried up. So they have no income. So they're coming to get meals from our window as well. So it is incredibly confronting when you open the window and you see new faces every single day and every single night that we've never seen before. And the numbers are increasing significantly at this time. So when we talk about homelessness, it's great that we're focused on getting the current crop of homeless people off the streets and getting them the support that they need. But we must never, ever forget potentially this new crew of people that are going to be homeless if we don't put the support around them that they need. Aaron, if I can bring you in now, how has COVID changed what you and, and the council are doing and I guess where you put the resources? Yeah, look, it's like Brendan, um, we we're extremely worried about what was going to happen um, to our most vulnerable. And, and that's not just um, those people experiencing homelessness, but, you know, the elderly, um, those who, you know, have pre-existing conditions, they're many of the people that City of Melbourne um, supports as well. So I think it's a, a, a bit of a minor miracle that we haven't had, um, you know, a huge spread uh, amongst um, our rough sleeper population in particular. And and I guess what you said, Ali, at the start, you realise that with all these impacts, they impact our most vulnerable uh, hardest because if you think of all the health messages which have been, you know, really important, you know, wash your hands, uh, stay at home, uh, and then you say that to someone who doesn't have a home and probably doesn't have running water. So even in the way we we assume uh, our health message is going out, we assume that people can, you know, get a roof over their heads, that they can isolate from each other. And I think one of the big eye-openers for us was um, seeing what happened in the public housing towers. You know, again, people with, you know, quite insecure um, accommodation where they might be overcrowded, they might be sharing facilities. Um, so... You know, homelessness isn't just about the the 300 or so people we had sleeping rough on our streets that Brendan and his team do such a wonderful job with. It's the fact that we're looking at you know 116,000 people that um, that classify as homeless across the country, and that's where you know we've got to have a huge focus. But I, I'm pleased to say that our on ground work, like every two weeks, Brendan, myself, Victoria Police, other agencies. Um, we meet every fortnight to see, you know, what's actually going on on the street and we, we change our response according to, to what we're seeing. And you made that point very well that someone's just made in a question that rough sleepers actually make up less than 10% of homelessness. I mean, you've got to, you know, what can we do to ensure that everyone, according to this question, has a warm and secure home? And just on that, the state government's pledged uh, to lease 1,100 properties from the private rental market. They've also got... They say the first 1,000 new social housing units that were promised as part of the 2018 election, they're almost ready. Is there any hope that some of these people will be able to go from hotel to long-term accommodation or is that a pipe dream? Well, look, that's the commitment that the state government's made, that, that none of the 2,000 rust sleepers who have gone into motel accommodation will, will be going back out onto the streets. They'll be going into uh, long-term pathways and more secure accommodation. But I think you know, it's great. It's, a, it's an excellent announcement. I'll never, ever begrudge an announcement like that. But when you look at the numbers, just in City of Melbourne alone, so just one municipality, we know by our own numbers that we're short 5,500 affordable homes right now. And if you look at Council to Homeless Persons and VCOS and those sorts of agencies, they're saying we need to build about 6,000 um, social housing units each year for the next 10 years just to catch up on the underspend that's happened 
uh, in social housing from from about year 2000. So it's it's a big job that's ahead of us. And, and I really would hope that that both the state government and the federal government see that, you know, a COVID stimulus on social housing build is, is money well spent because you're generating jobs in construction, but you're also solving an issue that's really, really um, a humanitarian issue at its, at, its, at its forefront. But what we now know from the studies is that for every dollar spent housing someone, you save $3 in community benefit because there's less presentations in the hospital system, less impact with the justice system. So it makes huge humanitarian sense but it also now makes economic sense. And we know that 77% of uh, people in Victoria, so that's a huge percentage if you think about um, the widespread survey that VCOS have just done, 77% of people in Victoria want um, more social housing built. So voters want it. It makes good economic sense and it's a good from a humanitarian outcome. The time really is now to, to get on with the job. Would seem a no-brainer, wouldn't it? But politics is never that simple, as you know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Shilali, can I bring you in here? How are you? Hi. Now, you've been in Magpie Housing, I think, for around four years. Tell us a little bit about where you live now and how you got there. Okay. So I live in a lovely house um, with a flatmate. Um, and I came into the program... Um, I started um, using uh, heroin um, in, uh, when I was at university and subsequently struggled with um, substance abuse um, for most of my life. And it had a serious impact on the choices I made um, and the choices that were available to me. I ended up in an abusive relationship, um, which I guess was characterised by extreme physical emotional and psychological abuse um, and it's never easy to leave but to leave a situation of abuse especially when there's um, uh, substance abuse involved because your decision making processes aren't um, aren't as clear as they would be but there's also I'd like to follow up on a, a few of the points that have been made previously and that is that the underinvestment in public housing makes the option to leave so much more difficult, especially when we're having a housing affordability crisis. Um, where do you go? And in the end, when I did leave, I almost had to embrace the idea that I was going to have to go through a period of homelessness um, or at least incredibly insecure housing. Um, in order to to rebuild my life, and that is in fact what what eventually happened. Um, so you you left that relationship, but you ended up on a park bench. Yes, yeah, I did. Yeah. And what was the turning point to where you are today? Um, meeting the lovely guys from the Salvation Army, um, and they offered me. Um, an opportunity to, um, yeah, to participate in this program. And without hyperbole, it has been life-changing. It has fundamentally changed not only my life and the trajectory of my life, but that of my family as well. Yeah, and I'll be, yeah, uh, they do amazing, life-changing work. Trevor, what about you? I know that you've been in Magpie Housing for a while, but how does it feel to be uh, about to be moving into your own place? Yeah, well, it's something I've wanted for a long time. I, um, I ended up in Magpie Housing because I, I slept on the streets for a little while and because I had a gambling addiction and blew all my money and couldn't pay me rent, so I ended up on the street. If it wasn't for the Salvation Army, I'd probably school there. But... Um, yeah, things are looking good now that I've uh, finally found a place of my own uh, and I'm moving uh, next Wednesday. Tell us a little bit about that because you've been in secure accommodation with Magpie and I, and I know we've just heard from Shalali just how good that has been. But is there something about being in your own place? Is that just that next step that makes all the difference? Yeah, well, that's right. Plus it gives someone else a chance to live in the place that make my nest where I was. And uh, like I've been trying to save money for ages and, you know, things happen. But finally I uh, 
got the money all together and um, so it'll, it'll be better to be on my own and then someone can take my place in Mac by Ness. Brendan, do you think that COVID is going to be a game changer? Do you think that it is something that has given the momentum uh, so that we're not having this conversation again in two years' time? Well, it depends what we do with it, Ellie. I, I think it presents itself as an incredible opportunity for us. When I say us, um, it's governments of all levels, but it's also agencies and it's the community as well to grab hold of this, I, I'd say, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So the amazing thing is there's literally thousands of people that are in hotel accommodation right across Victoria now that would not have been there if it wasn't for COVID. And I think, as Aaron mentioned earlier, the state government has made a very significant commitment to make sure that uh, enough housing is made available for those people that are in hotel accommodation, which is temporary, to come out and go into their own place. And we've got to make sure that happens, but we've also got to make sure, Ali, that it happens with all the appropriate supports because the risk is if we get somebody off the street, put them into accommodation or take them out of a hotel and put, their in, put them into their own home, and we don't surround them with the supports that they need, they can very quickly cycle back onto the streets. And we don't want that. That's the last thing that we want to see. So we, we want to make sure it's housing, it's, it's appropriate housing, but it's with all of the supports that people need to keep them in that housing. And you're talking about the supports that people need, which is obviously it's a very individual thing. It's you, you can't yeah. just have a, a blanket approach. I've got a question here. Uh, Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders represent just 3% of the general population, but 23% of the homeless population. Um, I'm assuming that that is correct. Do we need greater representation uh, contributing to, to this sort of discussion from that community, which is so disproportionately represented? Oh, absolutely. And, and that's statistics. I, I, I'm not sure if it's accurate, um, but I, I can say... But it rings that, true, doesn't it? Sorry? It rings true, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say, it actually is reflected in what we see at our centre in Burke Street in Melbourne, uh, where there is an absolutely disproportionate representation of people of Torres Strait Island and Aboriginal background. And I, I think we, we need to see people from those communities actually uh, be given the opportunity to get involved in this sort of work uh, because I think they will bring a whole range of skills and a whole range of understandings and experience that will really help get people on their feet and get them into accommodation and, and support them while they're in that accommodation. And I think that's absolutely critical. We can do everything we can um, and we will continue to work with communities of all backgrounds, but I think people with a, a very deep uh, experience and understanding are the ones that can actually keep people in accommodation. Mm. Aaron, we talked about the fact that you, well, we didn't, but I talked about the fact that you were in Filthy Rich and Homeless. How much of a, a game changer was being part of that? Did you really feel like you were homeless? I mean, you had a film crew following you around. Yeah, it's the um, the the I, I had a bit of a dim view of reality television, and um, you know I was approached by a friend of mine who I've known for for, for a long time and and done other TV work with, but all on the environment. So when she approached me about this series called Filthy Rich and Homeless, straight away, as you said, I, I said, well, hang on a second, the filthy rich part might not be quite correct, but once I sort of got through that, I, I watched series one and two and. You know, I was worried because I'd heard all that that um, terminology around poverty porn and you know using it as a as a chance to grab ratings. So I was really worried about what they would do in terms of respect for people who are experiencing homelessness. And I think what you get from Blackfella Films is just a, a real commitment to tell what is a hugely complex story. You know, with people that have you know been absolutely at their lowest, and they do that with an amazing degree of respect that I've you know, I've never really seen before with such a, a sensitive issue, but I, I'll never know what it's like to be truly homeless. Um, I've got a roof over my head. Um, you know, I've had a safety net even when I've been through some dark times myself because I've got family. And you realise that a lot of these, um, a lot of people that have been through these issues just don't have those safety networks. They're estranged from their family or, or something's gone on. Um, and I guess, so I, I can't say that I, I know what it's like to be homeless, but geez, it gave me a, a, a pretty brutal insight, even if it was just for a moment. Um, that first night of ending up in Sydney, 
in a city which you know I've been to as a tourist and, and gone there for work and think is a beautiful city, it took on a completely different feel as soon as you didn't have your phone and your money and you, went, you dropped off in the middle of the driving rain that rained for pretty much 48 hours straight. And I had to find a place to sleep. Um, so the city became scary and confusing. Uh, it became the boredom was the amazing thing. Like I just, all I had to do was was walk, and I just walked and walked, and you just become invisible. People look at you differently, or they don't look at you at all. And you know you can't go sit at a cafe and have a coffee like you you would in your normal life. Um, and I could just see the way it would eat eat away at your confidence. And you know any little health issue you had too would just be magnified. Like I got blisters on my feet, tiny little issue that if you're at home you'd put some band aids on and be no problems. But because I didn't have any of that stuff and I kept walking, they, that, a blister became a serious issue. So all of these things that you hear about, um, you know, what happens with people experiencing homelessness um, hit home really, really quickly. So it wasn't sort of five days into it. It was 24 hours into it and I was starting to think, I don't think I can do 10 days, let alone what some people have experienced long-term homelessness in weeks, months. You know, some people have been, a guy that Brendan and I went and saw the other day He's been homeless for 10 years. Um, the, the, the physical impact, I felt like I, I'd even aged after that, that 10 days and I was exhausted. So let alone someone says, oh, you should just go and get a job. Well, I, I couldn't even find a place to sleep that I felt safe in, let alone trying to build my, my, rebuild my life. So I just realised how important um, shelter was. Shilali, tell us about your first 24 hours and about how, how does it... How does it compare to what to what we just heard from Aaron? You're you're more you know after your first 24 hours. How does your experience relate to what Aaron was just saying? It's um yeah, it's quite something. The first the first 24 48 hours where you realise that you're on your own and that you have nowhere to go. When I left, I'd even left my wallet behind, so I I had the clothes I was standing in, um and it's daunt. It's it's an incredibly daunting feeling, and I would just like to follow up um, and echo something that Aaron um, just said about blisters. Um, I too had experience of getting blisters on the bottom of my feet, and it became really painful to walk. Um, so yeah, I can relate to that experience. And aging is there's. I was washing in the National Gallery um, bathroom. I'd go in there and have a bird bath to try and keep myself clean. And before I realised what services were available and started to negotiate and navigate the space of being homeless and then, you know, staying in backpackers. And it's, um, yeah, it's like you've fallen through a crack and you're in a, and you're, you're sort of looking up through, a glass, well, not a glass ceiling. I don't want to use that analogy, but it, it definitely feels like you've entered another an, another state of being. Yeah. And I guess that becomes a, a bit of a spiral. That if your self esteem is hit, if you feel like you're being judged, then your sense of isolation just builds on itself. Absolutely, and uh, just in terms of the way that you represent yourself in the world, you high heels or a, a mini skirt uh, they're, they're you know that the or a nice dress i started wearing tracksuit pants runners zip up hoodies um i had a backpack there was no i had no means of expressing my individuality and because because of that it's just practical clothing it's just living in that way and it's a self protection it's, it's about protecting yourself and you know, trying to avoid blisters and trying to avoid cold, but you lose you lose a sense of yourself. You lose your identity, and I think it's reflexive because the world looks at you in a particular way, and so therefore you start to internalize internalize some of that that stigma. I think, and to a degree which which I wasn't aware of until I was housed, and then had to go through the process of of understanding what I've just been through. Yeah. Oh, you, you said you made the point that you were having a bird bath before you found services and started to navigate the world of being homeless. Mm -hmm. how, how easy is it to not just find what's available, but to bring yourself to access it? 
Uh, um, really difficult because at that point you you start to identify. It's it's about a, you know identity. Um, it's an identity issue, but it's also. Um, It's the dignity that you have to suspend when you're having a shower in a service, when you walk out of the shower, there's people having lunch or, you know, having a shower at the salvos. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I'm lost for words, actually. It's, it's such an alienating and... Is this, Shalali, is this why you want to be a social worker? Because you will have an incredible empathy with people who need help. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely why I want to be a social worker. Trevor, what about you? Do you identify with that uh, sense of isolation, I guess? And did you also have to work when you first came to Magpie at, at rebuilding yourself? Yeah, well, um, being on the streets was pretty ordinary and Trying to find a place to have a shower it wasn't until I um, found out where the salvos were that after a few weeks where I could have a shower and something to eat. You know, it was pretty daunting. And then um, trying to, I went to Centrelink and I didn't have enough identification to go on Centrelink. And if it wasn't for the salvos, you know, I just don't know where I'd be, really. But you had to find the salvos first. Yeah, that's right. Is there much of a, 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 a word on the street? Is there much of a community among homeless people to try and help you navigate that? Yeah, well, um, I run into a, a few people and you get chatting and they just tell you where the uh, places are available to go and get something to eat and get some help. Mm. I should just remind people who are listening that you can ask a question in the chat section uh, on YouTube. So do join us and I'll ask your questions as we go along. And in fact, I'll, I'll, Trevor, if I can just stay with you, I've got a question here. Can you describe how you'd like the general public to behave when they see a homeless person or someone living on the street? What type of displayed behaviour is encouraging? I just treat them as a normal person. They are normal people. They've just got addictions and um, they, they need help. They don't need to be looked down upon. And um, we, uh, there's a lot of people that are, they beg on the street, you know, and people just look at them and strangely, you know, and uh, yeah, just treat them as normal people. Shalali, what do you think? What, what sort of behaviour would you like to see from other people? I think, yeah, empathy and compassion. And when you see people in a state of distress, I, I think sometimes it's difficult to suspend judgment, but you have to remember that people don't have the privilege of intimacy and they don't have the privilege of privacy. Your life is being lived in public. So you lose, you know, a fundamental, uh, you know, a fundamental human experience of privacy is just gone. Yeah. So while I say um, to, to approach people with empathy and compassion by the same, at the same time, if somebody's sleeping and seems like they're just trying to live their life, um, it might not be the right time to to intercede with your um, with your well-meaning compassion. <laughs> uh, Brendan, there's sort of two issues that have come from this last bit of the conversation, I guess. One is the, um, the issue of making sure that people know what they can get and how they can get it. But the second is helping them come to the point that they'll access it. Uh, do you find that you have to deal with... Uh, the first thing you have to deal with is, is not necessarily the, um, the, the physical needs, but the mental needs of people, the building up of the person so that they can accept your help. Yeah, absolutely, Ali. I, I think there's a couple of things that we need to work on uh, all the time. And one is that it's actually about the need for us to take our service outside of the building. It's very easy in this sort of work uh, to find yourself, I, I think subconsciously, 
withdrawing into a way of working that suits you. So you see a lot of services that work during office hours, uh, and yet the need is often outside of those hours. You see a lot of services offer their service through a building, and yet where the need is is out on the streets. And so as services, we need to be flexible, we need to be nimble, and we need to make sure we're actually going to where the people are during the times that they need to access our services. Um, I, I think the other thing too is um, what we've found in, in the past, we along with other services have operated in a really transactional manner. So people will come in and they'll ask for help and then uh, we provide that help and they, they go on their way. But if we're really serious about seeing lives turned around, then we need to be committed to a highly relational model of care. And, and that means taking ourselves out of the OA comfort zones and actually going out, sitting down and actually listening to people. It's very easy in this situation or in these roles to try and impose what we think is the right answer on people. And often we get it wrong. And I, I remember uh, when I first started doing this work, I spoke to a man that was sleeping rough in a park near Parliament House. And I said to him, guess what, I can get you a place. And he said, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. And I insisted, I organised a place for him, I got him into it, and I walked away a little bit proud, thinking, wow, that's a great outcome. And about a week later, I saw that man on Burke Street, and he lifted up his shirt, and he had a wound in his stomach, and he had a cord tied around his neck, and he said to me, you did this to me, you did this to me. And I said, um, I'm completely confused. You know, what do you mean I did it to you? And he said... I, I cannot live inside four walls, but you made me do it and I could not cope. And it was a really powerful lesson for me that uh, in this work, we have to sit and listen. The people that we work with are not stupid, as you hear tonight. They, they know what they need and we need to take the time in their environment to actually just sit and listen and when they're ready to speak, actually take on board what they're saying and get their input to help shape the way forward. Um, too long in our industry, I think we've enforced what we think is the right thing on people. We more often than not get it wrong. Shalali, you, you've talked about, actually, it's really interesting that you say it's easy when you're homeless to, to adopt other people's, you didn't use the word cynicism, but I, I get the feeling that's sort of what you mean about what's available, that there's a tendency to think, no, nah, there's nothing available, they won't help, they're too busy, they don't care. Yeah, absolutely. I think bad information gets shared and I think you do pick up on that cynicism um, and start to believe that there are no supports available even if you did try to access them um, yeah I think what, what's one way that that we all, all of us can change that I think um, investing in public housing. I mean, as Brendan was saying, people that are homeless aren't, you know, while it's a different experience, you're not outside of society completely and you're aware that there is an, an underinvestment in public housing. You're aware that your options are very limited. Um, boarding houses are some of the most dangerous places that you could possibly put yourself. And I chose not to live in a boarding house. Um, I would prefer to live in a backpackers because at least there's somebody there. There's, there, there's staff there. It's clean to an extent. When you're in a boarding house, there, there's no oversight. They're, they're incredibly dangerous places. And so if there's anything I would like to, to contribute to this conversation, it would be, yes, we need to invest in housing. We need a huge investment in housing and also affordable housing, not just public housing. We need to address afford the affordability of housing across the board. Um, and also we need to look at that, that the, the space which is missed, and that is the space in between sleeping rough and being safely and sustainably housed because in that space, there is so much room for abuse and neglect um, and you become invisible because you're not on the street, but you're not safe and you have no pathway really out financially. Um, you're surrounded by drugs. So trying to remain clean in that environment is wishful thinking. 
I mean, you, it would take an, a will of absolute iron to, to remain clean in that environment. So I think we need to look at that space. Shalani, people, you mean, yeah. do you mean emergency accommodation? So, so more transitional while the longer term is sorted? Yeah, or yeah, but I'm, I'm looking accommodation. Um, not necessarily. I'm I'm talking about private, um, private boarding houses which occupy a huge, which, um, and Brendan could probably speak to this, um, with, with more authority than myself. But, um, one of the main options for housing are private boarding houses which are run for profit, um. And um, at the expense of people's safety, and they're exploitative. They're incredibly exploitative um, situations, and they're very difficult to extract yourself from once you find yourself there. Brendan, oh, I, I just I think Shalali's point is absolutely spot on in terms of um, there are certainly rooming houses that have been set up illegally, and uh, they've been rife in certain parts of the country. And basically, they're an arrangement which is absolutely profit-driven. And uh, in a lot of those illegal rooming houses, there's absolutely no desire uh, to care for or look after the individuals that are staying there. It's all about what money we can make out of this. Um, and I think uh, the State Government of Victoria has done some really good work around addressing that particular issue. Um, and I think Shalali's spot on again when she talks about the absolute need for us uh, to have more public housing built. And I think that's the point Aaron was making very clearly before too. Um, that, that's the key. But it's also, as I mentioned before, it's, it's not just about housing. We need to make sure that supports are available if people require those. Um, because I, I think one of the things that we see, Ali, is there are people that go into housing and if they're not given the appropriate support, they cycle back out onto the street. And if that happens a couple of times, when you actually approach someone that's sleeping rough and you, you try to organise housing for them, they, they, they've got to the point in a lot of cases where they've given up on themselves and they actually think that their inability to maintain housing is their fault. And when you actually say to them, hey, we can organise somewhere for you to go, they actually, their, their attitude basically is, well, what's the point? You know, I've tried, I've failed. And in my mind, when I see that sort of thinking or hear that verbalised, I, I think to myself, no, no, it's not you that's failed, it's we. You know, it's the system that's actually let you down. And I, I think when we see that, that's where we need to do absolutely everything we can to build trust, build relationship, and actually start to empower people again to believe that with the appropriate supports, they actually can get back on their feet. And if they fail, um, Gosh, more often than not, it's not their failure. It's, it, it often sits with us uh, and sits with others. Brendan, though, can, that, that issue of uh, the, bre the boarding houses or the rooming houses is a really interesting one. And you say that the government's done quite a bit of work, but is there an argument that the government should be taking these boarding houses over, cleaning them up and turning them into places where people can come off the street while you sort out permanent accommodation? Because permanent accommodation doesn't happen like that. You know, you have to find people something that suits them. Yeah, I, I think one of the challenges is uh, when we talk about boarding houses, rooming houses, um, when they're run illegally, often what happens is it might be a three or four bedroom house, uh, but it accommodates 10 or 12 people. And you don't have the necessary fire alarms or smoke detectors uh, installed. You don't have locks on doors. Um, and, and this is the sort of thing that Shalali and Trevor can attest to. Um, and, and so you, you don't want that sort of concept perpetuated. You want to end that. Uh, and so when we say, you know, government should be coming in and taking these places over, we need to remember that if they do, they would very quickly revert those places back to being what they need to be, which is a three or four bedroom house, not a place accommodating 8, 10, 12 people. So I, I think governments taking over existing illegal rooming houses is not necessarily going to fix the problem. Um, in terms of finding more accommodation. Don't forget that you can ask a question uh, through the chat function if you wish to join the conversation. A couple of ones here. Uh, Trevor, if I can put this to you and then I'll put it to Shalali as well. Uh, how do rough sleepers know about the services that are available to them, especially with limited resources? Trevor, where, where did you find out 
where to go? Was it just other people? Yeah, people on the street. You, you chat to people. Like, I had a, a beard and long hair and people knew that I was homeless and you, they just came up to you and they advised you where the places to go. I had no idea what I was uh, going to do until the, you meet these people in similar situations. And then when you, I suppose, is it then a question if you walk through the doors of the Salvos in Burke Street and then you come into contact with someone from the Salvos who tells you about the next layer of resources, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, they, they just helped me enormously. Um, and uh, I, I can't praise them enough. Shilali, do you, does that reflect your experience, sort of hearing about where to go on the street? And can you think of a way of making it easier to find out what's available? Um, I think in terms of traditional channels, like um, the internet, for example, advertising, when you're homeless, you're quite often without technology or without um reliable um, internet access. So I think outreach is one of the best ways um, being, as Brendan was saying, being where homeless people are um, and, you know, doing that outreach work. Because I know when I was living in the squat and um, the, um, that, was, that was one of the first times I came in contact with the Selvos when the squat was being closed down and they came and they were there to offer support and, and advice. So I think, yeah, um, outreach is a, um, a really, really important aspect of that. Aaron, from the city of, of Melbourne's point of view, do you, um, do, you, do you think that the council has that same incredible learning, almost revelation that, that happened for Brendan such a long time ago about the need to come at this problem from the, the, the point of view of the person in need as opposed to a top-down, we're going to give you this? Well, I mean, I just want to pick up on one point that Shalali just said there too about um, outreach being so critical. Even in this COVID time where a lot of people have said, oh, you know, everyone's gone into motel accommodation, so that problem's, that problem's solved. Um, but what we've found is that um, what we've got is, you know, 30 or so individuals with really, really complex needs who, as Brendan said, you know, aren't going to um, go into accommodation. They've refused going in there. And people would say, well, hang on, why don't they just go into the accommodation? But that uh, being inside might be where their childhood trauma happened or it might be, you know, a serious mental illness that they've got. And so that relationship first is really important. And so City of Melbourne actually has social workers based at our libraries because what we were finding is that um, lots of people experiencing homeless were coming in to use the internet or coming in to use the service in libraries. And so it's been a really kind of softly, softly approach where, you know, then our social worker has a chat and builds up that trusting relationship. And I think the really critical thing is, you know, some of these interactions might happen really quickly if someone's not been on the streets for very long and they just want to get accommodation and they're ready to be helped or supported to find their own way. Some of these interactions are 10 times... We had one individual, it was 50 different times that that, um, that our teams had gone out to build that trusting relationship. So I think uh, I'm not so sure that we, we really still see, um, I, I think that terminology of the homeless or them. Um, so the more that we can say us, because the one thing I, you know, that hit home for me so profoundly on, on the show was when I spent time with Phil, who was living out of his car in Dapto um, near Wollongong. And we just connected, like we just, within 48 hours, we were sharing our deepest secrets and, you know, some really personal stuff that, you know, you wouldn't think um, you'd be sharing. And and I just thought far out, just, you know, there, there but the grace go, I, I it, you're only sort of a job being lost or, or you know, a domestic violence situation or, or, or some, you know, injury or whatever that, that, that you know, you too could would end up like that if you don't have the safety net of, of family. So I think the more that we can stop saying them or the homeless or um, it, it's people who are experiencing homeless who have had a few um, tough luck um, outcomes and, and all of a sudden ended up in a place where they deserve our support to rebuild themselves. That's, 
I think I think we've still got a way to go on that. We've only got seven or eight minutes left, uh, so I just want to run through some of these questions. Quite a few of them probably are best suited for Brendan. Brendan, what percentage of homeless are university students because of COVID? Do you have any sense of that? Uh, not at the moment, uh, Ali. I, I think that's going to come to light fairly soon. So um, we're still at the beginning of COVID, and what we're seeing is, as I mentioned before, an increasing number of international students that are coming to us for practical help like meals. Uh, and for emergency relief parcels. But our real concern is that fairly soon, uh, those people will actually start to transition into homelessness, but we're not sure of the percentage at this stage. One, one thing, Ali, that we can say is we're not necessarily the percentage, but we, um, we put out $200 um, food vouchers for international students specifically, and we thought we might get 1,000 people taking up those food vouchers, and we got 17,000. But are you going to do that so again? Because that was a while ago. Exactly. So this is the thing is I think that um, I think the you know if that if that's just a small um, signal of, of how much trouble that our international students are in, uh, I'm deeply concerned that they they're not is getting the, the support. Is the council they still need. issuing those vouchers? No. So we had we had that they're all expended. Um, we'll keep on looking, you know, as much as we can to to support them. But I I think we need a far more structural issue where you know they they're they're on a a student visa or they're, they're on a, a working visa and don't have any work and then they can't access any any of our support systems. So um, I think the federal government needs to, to have another look at that and say, surely we have to help. International students have been so good for, for Melbourne. You know, they're, they're really the fabric of our, of our city. Um, they make Melbourne, you know, such a, a vibrant place. Um, we should be reaching out to support them like we're supporting others. Sure, and, they, and, and most of them can't go home even if they, even if they wanted to go home. Um, a, a question, Brendan, about uh, Magpie House and the time frame a person can stay in temporary accommodation like Magpie House. It's really until they're ready to leave, isn't it, Brendan? Yeah, that's right. And, and just back on international students, Ali, I should mention that uh, the City of Melbourne have actually provided us with some funding to establish a drop-in centre for international students so at the moment, we're in the middle of the COVID-19 lockdown, uh, stage four restrictions. So we're not able to open the doors, but we're doing it online. Um, and we're about to launch that very shortly. Uh, and then we'll, when we're able to, we'll transition into a face-to-face -face arrangement. And that will give us uh, more intimate knowledge of where people are at, what we need to do to support them. In terms of Magpie Nest, it's, it's very open. So we don't say it's medium term or short term or long term. It's really what suits the individual person. And, I think that's the real beauty of that program. It's supported significantly by the Collingwood Football Club Foundation. And uh, we've got caseworkers that work intensively with each of the 145 people that are living in that program in one of the 50 houses um, that's been provided. And when people are ready to move, that's when you know they'll engage with a caseworker and um, steps will be put in place to help make that happen. I know last time we spoke, it took me a while to make the connection between the fact that Collingwood supported it and it was called the Magpie. <laughs> I'm a little it's the, only <laughs> the only time I like the Collingwood Football Club, Alice. <laughs> yeah, you, this you and many, I imagine. There might be some people out there who support Collingwood and who'd like to support the Salvos, so we love you. Um, <laughs> hey, Brendan, another question. How do people establish financial independence? In fact, I mean, I know Trevor. Trevor's been working with you guys. That's really helped him to save up some money, but... What what else is needed on that front for sustained recovery? Oh, gosh, it's an incredibly complex one because, uh, gosh, you know, what, what happens, Ellie, is we, we, we often have conversation with people that are experiencing homelessness and we say, what, what does life look like going forward? You know, what do you want it to look like? And, and people often respond and say, I just want to lead a normal life. And you say, okay, we'll unpack that for us. And they'll often say, I just want to get a place to live. I want to do some study or I want to get a job. Um, and not always, but often, uh, some of the people that we are working with uh, end up with criminal records or convictions. And that often prevents them from access to employment. And it's a huge, huge barrier um, that prevents them from actually getting on with their lives and doing the sort of things that they want to do. And they end up often in this vicious cycle where they think, well, I really want to work, but I'm not going to be able to work. So in some cases, they end up back into a life of crime again and then back in prison in some cases. So um, we're doing everything we can to work with people and work with the Department of Justice to help work through those issues. 
to empower people so that they can start to get employment and, uh, and, and become much more independent. Um, I, I think the other thing too is when you're working with a group of people who in some cases, um, you know, their, their lifestyle is nocturnal and you're trying to get them into employment, it, you need an employer who's actually very flexible and very understanding. And they're not always easy to find. And uh, we're, we're working with Colony Football Club at the moment and a number of other organisations to try and establish social enterprises that will provide that flexibility, provide that training, provide that support so that people can start to re-enter the workforce again uh, and start to understand what it means to be a part-time or full-time employee. Um, and then eventually they can transition into long-term employment is the goal. Mm. Look, we've only got uh, two or three minutes left. I just want to ask each member of our panel, I guess, hopes and dreams, but hopes and dreams on a really practical level. Um, just the next sort of 12, 24 months, Trevor, what are you hoping for? Well, hopefully end coronavirus and get back to normal. And grow your garden. Have you got a little garden in your new place? Yeah. <laughs> It's fantastic. Shalali, what do you hope for? Um, well, I would like to do really well um, with my uni grades. Um, I'm on track at the moment. I've started reading the Iliad, so hopefully wow. I'll, I'll finish the Iliad. I've attempted before, haven't got there, so maybe this time. And oh, to, wow. see, to see my niece and nephews. Yeah. I was going to say, the Iliad is a, is a great undertaking, but what a time to do it. If you're ever going to do it, lockdown's probably the time to do it. <laughs> Aaron, what about you? What are your hopes and dreams? Do they include becoming the Lord Mayor of Melbourne? Oh, look, um, probably more a Bombers Premiership, Ali. That would be, would be nice. I, I, I might be waiting nicely, a while for that Nicely one. avoided that question. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's called a handball or a sidestep, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think on, on this issue... I mean, like Trevor, I, I just want to see the back of this virus. It's it's having such a big impact, um, and a lot of that impact is on our on our most vulnerable. But I, I I just one of the biggest learnings for me that I didn't have before I started trying to understand this issue is that it is solvable. I thought it was just something that you had to put up with, you know, in world cities. But all the solutions are there, so I, I just hope that people start to believe that this is solvable and sign up to everybody's home the petition calling on the state and federal governments to build social housing because without the housing everything else is 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 really a lot more difficult so it's solvable and and let's roll up our sleeves and and you know make it a thing of the past brendan uh, I, I agree with um everybody that's spoken but particularly around social housing but I'd love to see uh, far greater investment in dealing with really complex mental health issues and addiction issues. It's not uh, enough now. Sorry? Not enough now. No, no, definitely not. And, and that's um, one of the drivers for why so many people are on the streets at the moment in the middle of the pandemic. Um, I, I'd really love to see uh, the development of social enterprises that train and employ um, people that find it really difficult to break into the current labour market and... Uh, I, I think that would be amazing to see people start to feel just really confident in their own ability again because they're employed. I should. Uh, I just want to say to everyone, don't forget that uh, you can also uh, listen to another panel next Wednesday when there's a, a youth panel, Shut Up and Listen is what it's called. I love that title. I'd like to do a radio program called that, I reckon. Um, and all the details of that are on the AIS website. But right now, a massive thank you to our panel tonight, to Trevor, to Shalali, to Aaron and to Brendan and to the Salvos for the absolutely extraordinary work that you do. Uh, until we meet again, stay safe and stay well and take care. Thank you. Thanks very much. Night, everyone.